Well, we are covering some heavy material, and there's a lot of it. So we're going to move with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, and majestic instancy as we talk about making sense of the God of the Old Testament. And if you want to read more about these things, I cover some of this material in my book is God a Moral Monster and on the uh, violence in the Old Testament, uh, did God really command genocide and uh, also the issues of servitude and uh, violence and, uh, and the use of force and so forth in my biblical ethics book too. So feel free to check those out. But let's begin with a <clears throat> notable, uh, notorious quotation from Richard Dawkins, the world's uh, most uh, outspoken atheist, uh, who says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Take a breath. So that's, uh, we won't have time to unpack all of what Richard Dawkins uh, has charged here, Uh, but this is where we do want to go. Uh, First of all, in our overview, just looking at some of these baffling Old Testament passages, how do we approach some of these head-scratching questions? And then we want to talk about the God of the Old Testament. A lot of times people pit the God of the Old Testament against the God of the New. Uh, We are not going to do that. Also, we'll look, at the, we'll look at the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, how does it help us to understand a bit of the ancient Near East as we look at some of these texts? Uh, then we'll look at the nature of Israel's laws, a bit, of, a bit on Israel's warfare, and then servitude in the Old Testament, all in 50 minutes. <laughs> so, let's begin. As we look at Old Testament texts that are baffling to us, keep in mind, take heart that you are not alone in some of these difficult passages or difficult commands. Uh, We see that Old Testament saints themselves are baffled by God. Uh, They give us permission, as it were, to wonder, to ask questions, to, uh, to ask God, what about that? So we have Job's afflictions, for example, that come without cause. And so Job demands an audience with God. Though he slay me, I will wait for him. Surely I will argue my ways before him. He wants an audience with God. He, there is no, uh, there is no, nothing to provoke this sort of a thing. And so he wants this audience with God and, and, uh, and, and so he eventually gets that. But we, we also see David getting angry when Uzzah is struck down for touching the toppling ark. And God doesn't rebuke David in his anger. Of course, there were rules about how to transport the ark. Also, Habakkuk the prophet, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. The Bible takes evil, injustice, very seriously. And these prophets are wondering why the delay in judgment. The imprecatory psalmists wonder this too. They're asking, God, why are you not acting? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Psalm 13, even the prophet Jeremiah says, you deceived me, and I was deceived. That's coming from a prophet of the Lord, talking to the Lord. Uh, So we're in good company when we're asking questions, when we're wondering about the problem of evil, when we're wondering about injustice. So, Keep that in mind as you reflect and process about some of these questions. Let's move on to this second category. I told you we'd be moving briskly. The Old Testament God is the God with whom Jesus and the New Testament writers identify. Some people say, yeah, I know, that's very clear, but a lot of people raise this question, isn't Is the God of the Old Testament really the same as the God of the New? Isn't the God of the Old Testament wrathful and vindictive and the God of the New Testament loving, kind, compassionate, says pray for your enemies, turn the other cheek, and so forth? Well, here's one scholar, uh, Peter Enns, who raises these sorts of questions. He's a bit critical. He takes, uh, he leans more in the direction of the greater differentiation 
between the two. Uh, he says the New Testament leaves behind the violent tribal outsider-insider rhetoric of a significant portion of the old. Instead, the character of the one people of God, now made up of Jew and Gentile, is dominated by such behaviors as faith in Christ, working itself out in love, self-sacrifice, praying for one's enemies and persecutors. You know, Jesus 101. The Old, Testament, the Old and New Testaments give us rather different portrayals of God. Well, is that the case? Are they rather different portrayals? Well, how do we respond to this sort of a statement? Well, for one thing, Jesus didn't come up with love your enemies. Both the Old Testament as well as the New command us to love our enemies. In Exodus 23, we're told, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. Sounds like loving your enemy, doesn't it? And this passage in Proverbs 25 is quoted in the New Testament by Paul. In Romans 12, he's, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink, for you'll heap burning coals on his head, etc. So it's in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Jesus didn't make up this idea of loving your enemies. It's found embedded within Old Testament texts. But there's more. When we look at what Jesus actually affirms, he notes that God indeed commanded capital punishment for certain acts in the law of Moses. In Matthew 15, 4, Jesus is saying, For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of his father or mother is to be put to death. That's Jesus. Jesus also acknowledged God's judgments in the ancient world. Sodom, Gomorrah, Tyre, Sidon, Noah's flood. These were acts that Jesus acknowledges took place. It's not as though he's saying, but we don't believe that, it, you know, that really didn't happen or that was just, you know, mythological or something. No, he's saying judgment was indeed wrought on these peoples in the ancient world. Jesus himself pronounces woes on stumbling blocks, false teachers, wicked cities of his day. There are a lot of passages. I mean, take, take a look at, you know, if you look at Matthew chapter 18, where, uh, where Jesus talks about the one who leads one of these little ones astray, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's the Jesus who says, love your enemies. Jesus speaks very forcefully, very powerfully against those who would lead his disciples astray. Jesus dries up money changers from the temple. That's the Jesus who says, turn the other cheek. Which, by the way, is, is uh, you know, if you're slapped on the cheek, that's an insult. It's not actually understood as an act of violence or force. And uh, you can read more about that in the books that I've mentioned. <clears throat> Stephen and Paul uh, take for granted in their sermons in the book of Acts. They take for granted the Israelites driving out the Canaanites. They're referring to this as part of salvation history. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul has a long list of negative examples from ancient Israel where God brings judgment upon disobedient, grumbling, sexually immoral Israelites who tested God. So Paul reminds us to look to them so that you don't follow in their footsteps, nor to become proud. But I'm glad I'm not like those Israelites. He says, if anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. We see in both Testaments, and I like this passage that summarizes what we see in both Testaments, Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Paul says, behold the kindness and the severity of God. The kindness and the severity of God. They're in both Testaments. But we can say this, that in the New Testament, there is an intensification of the love of God shown in Jesus Christ, that we see God's love fully displayed in the self-giving, self-sacrificial act of Jesus on the cross. But in light of that, there's also an intensification of judgment, that if we reject that gift that God has given to us, then there is greater responsibility, greater judgment worthiness if we turn away from so great a salvation. And we see that reflected in Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 12. So that's a little bit of an overview of the question of the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New. Uh, in fact, there is an identity between the two rather than uh, some sort of compartmentalization or dichotomy between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Well, let's talk about <clears throat> the, uh, 
the, the messy situation that God steps into uh, when He interacts with the people of Israel and gives the laws and so forth. Uh, a key text is found in Matthew 19.8 where Jesus is talking about uh, divorce legislation. Jesus points back to the beginning, the biblical vision, uh, what God intends from the, from the outset at creation, that God made man and woman from the beginning to, uh, to be with one another uh, in marriage, uh, that is to be permanent, as I heard, just heard Greg Kokel yesterday saying, uh, one man, one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. That's Jesus' view of marriage. Now, Jesus says that the, in this legislation, He says that the... When, when, you, when Moses was legislating this, it wasn't as though this was ideal. He says go, Moses permitted this because of the hardness of human hearts. When the law came to Israel, there is a fallen, broken social and moral structure to things. And so God steps into this situation and legislates not the ideal, but things to keep matters under control. Uh, so just think about this. Uh, try to bring, for example, uh, if you could, democracy to a place like Saudi Arabia. What would be required to change a certain mindset? When you look at, uh, say, the, the strong, you know, very, very hierarchical society, the, the patriarchy, the, uh, the uh, diminishing of women and their rights and so forth, uh, we think of honor killings and so on. Uh, well, any sort of change that would come would have to be done incrementally. Just because you change the laws doesn't mean that the people are suddenly going to change their minds about things, that, they're, uh, that, they're, that their lifestyle is somehow going to be altered. Uh, Bruce Birch, uh, an Old Testament scholar, talks about how the ancient world is very, very different from our own. We ought, ought to be careful about superimposing our own assumptions about how things ought to be done on an ancient world, and, and we see a lot of things that have developed in the Western world thanks to the influence of the Christian faith with its emphasis on human dignity, human rights, and so forth. But he talks about how these texts are rooted in cult a cultural context utterly unlike our own, with moral presuppositions and categories that are alien, and in some cases repugnant to our modern sensibilities. I think if we recognize that, I think we're going to see that uh, we can just treat the Old Testament, look at the Old Testament in its own right rather than thinking that it's got to live up to some sort of a modern standard. Oliver O'Donovan uh, from Britain talks about how uh, there, there's a, a suspension that is needed, a suspension of moral judgment to allow an ancient society constructed on different terms from any we know to uh, express its own moral priorities. So C.S. Lewis puts it this way, he talks about guarding against a chronological snobbery, that we're so much better than those people back then, uh, that it's easy to become condescending or feel smug and superior when we look at the way things were back then. Uh, the, uh, the poet Alexander Pope uh, said this in his essay of man, he said, we think our fathers fools, so wise we grow, our wiser sons, no doubt, will think us so. <clears throat> so God begins where people are when it comes to polygamy, to patriarchy, to warfare, and He moves them in a redemptive direction. He doesn't keep them there, but tries to move them in a redemptive direction. And also keep this in mind that God doesn't issue all of His commands with uh, the same kind of delight. Of course, when He talks about loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself, that's one level, but when there is this uh, command that God says to drive out the Canaanites, those are commands that are uh, given with a grieving, uh, sad, reluctant heart. God doesn't afflict willingly, we're told in Lamentations 3, and God desires forgiveness over judgment as we see in the book of Jonah. But when people have reached a certain rock bottom, when people have reached the end of the line when it comes to morality, that there is no resolution, that there is no uh, turning back, then judgment must fall. John Golden Gay from Fuller Seminary says that God gets His hands dirty to a certain point, that He works within a fallen world, though not the original product of His own pure hands. <clears throat> Another book that you may want to take a look at is uh, 
a thick uh, book, Seriously Dangerous Religion, written by a noted uh, Old Testament scholar, Ian Proven, at Regent uh, College in Vancouver. He talks about how in the Old Testament, God is accommodating Himself to the reality on the ground in the ancient Near East, that God doesn't legislate His kingdom into being. Rather, what we have is that there is a vision in the Old Testament, that we ought to differentiate the vision of the Old Testament that we see in Genesis 1, God making all people equal in the image of God, that God makes man and woman to be united in marriage rather than you know, other uh, alternative arrangements, polygamy and, and so forth. But that vision is not necessarily always going to be reflected in the laws that are given. Uh, punishments and so forth, Th those laws are often negative to keep things regulated, to keep things under control, but it doesn't mean that those laws are reflecting that broader vision that God has for all the people, even though He is seeking to move them in a different direction, in a new direction. And that's why He sends His prophets to remind them to, to love God and, uh, and so forth. As, as God interacts with the world, He is often pragmatic though without being unjust. So God is acting in a very practical way, working with the situation on the ground and taking it as it is. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit more about these laws. That there, it's interesting, and it, we'll have to speed through this, but, but as you look at Israel's laws, there's a certain dynamism and context to them that not all of them are permanently fixed uh, or static. Uh, again, Matthew uh, tells us that certain laws were just permitted because of the hardness of human hearts. Uh, and let me give, start by illustrating this. When, you know, I've got six kids, and when they are you know, ages, 19, uh, ages 19 up to 26, and when our kids were younger, I would tell them, okay, kids, hold my hand when we're crossing the street. But, you know, when they're teenagers, you don't say, okay, kids, hold my hand when we're crossing the street. And maybe one of these days they'll say, Dad, hold my hand when we're crossing the street. <laughs> and in the same way, there's a certain incrementalism, a certain context to a lot of these laws that we recognize there's a certain period of time for which these laws function. And then once they have fulfilled their purpose, then they are no longer necessary. So let's talk about this. There are a number of clusters of laws in the Old Testament. There are, first of all, the kind of the core, the Ten Commandments that we see repeated in, also in Deuteronomy. Uh, the Covenant Code, Exodus 20 through 23. And then there is a priestly code that is given that is directed, of course, to the priests. And then a holiness code that is directed to the broader people. And then there is what's called the Deuteronomic Code, which is Deuteronomy 12 through 26. So in this law, set of laws, it's not as though it's all given, boom, one chunk at a time. There are different stages to this as Israel is in the wilderness and then uh, culminating in the Deuteronomic Code. And there are things that we'll see uh, change along the way. The Ten Commandments, of course, remain a stable core throughout the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, they are all repeated in one form or another, uh, except for the Sabbath law. And Paul talks about the Sabbath as having been fulfilled in Christ, that, uh, that you know, Paul says in Colossians 2, let no one judge your Sabbath. And, and Romans 14, it was some people consider one day as more special than the others, some consider them all alike, let everyone be convinced in his own mind. Uh, if you want to read more about that, take a look at my ethics book, but I'll just uh, mention that in passing. Also, keep this in mind, this is helpful to remember, too, that Israel goes through a number of different stages in its own development as a nation, that they're, first of all, an, an ancestral wandering clan, that there are certain moral imperatives that they're operating under that just wouldn't apply when they are uh, living under a monarchy. So we have, say, a theocracy then that comes uh, when we get to the book of, you know, when we get to the people being formed as a nation. So as they're wandering in the wilderness and so forth, there is this theocracy. But the people say, no, we actually want a king. And so they, they enter into becoming a monarchy, an institutional state. God working with a wrong-headed idea, but yet incorporating this into His plan to bring about salvation through the Prince of Peace, Jesus of Nazareth. So then there is the monarchy or the kingdom, and then there is the afflicted remnant. Uh, and then there is the post-exilic community. Uh, that comes back from the, uh, from the land of Babylon. Uh, 
So there are different stages and, again, different moral laws that correspond to those different stages. <clears throat> also, we have within the law of Moses certain adjustments that are made. Uh, there are new circumstances, new places of worship, the Israelites petitioning for certain things to be done, and so the law is adjusted in keeping with those. <clears throat> so, for example, Zelophehad's daughters, <clears throat> they petition Moses <clears throat> excuse me, to receive their father's inheritance, and God grants that request. So here in this patriarchal society, they are given this benefit of being listened to by God and this equality that they are able to receive that inheritance. Also, we have the altar that is to be built of uncut stones we see in the covenant code. But then with the tabernacle and then, of course, with the temple, the, the altar is made of acacia wood. So there's this shift that takes place. So we can call it an alteration, if you will. <clears throat> Also, the ceremonially unclean can't eat meat from their offerings, yet later on uh, the text permits this very thing. Uh, the ceremonially unclean person uh, who comes into contact with a dead body isn't allowed to celebrate the Passover, but this is revised upon appeal uh, that they can celebrate the Passover. The Apostle Paul uh, would later talk about the law of Moses being kind of like a tutor or a custodian, someone who is, uh, is, is, is responsible for the child until he becomes of legal age, and say, the same way the law has a function until Christ comes. Paul saw, we could use a modern-day analogy, of a booster rocket that is essential for the rocket to break out of the Earth's atmosphere. And then once that happens, that rocket is no longer necessary. It is dropped off. And in the same way, Israel, this national people, uh, no longer is God's people, but this gives way to a new people of God, namely the church, an inter-ethnic people of God throughout the world, scattered through every tribe and tongue uh, and people and nation, that God's people uh, are found therein. And so a lot of these laws of punishments and so forth don't apply to this new people of God. Even in the New Testament, we see that the Jerusalem Council, there's a certain uh, way of dealing initially with you know, you know, the gen Gentiles uh, and coming into, into, the, into, the, into the church, and how do we deal with our, the sensitivities of our Jewish brothers? Well, basically stay away from meat offered to idols, but Paul later on adjusts that and fine-tunes it and says, I mean, ultimately there is nothing wrong with idle meat uh, uh, out, sold out on the marketplace, so you can eat it if you want, but if you have got a conscience about it, then don't. So there are these sorts of things. Paul, uh, you know, we can, he adds another condition to uh, divorce as the gospel is spread to the Gentiles, something Jesus wasn't addressing. Uh, when Jesus says that divorce was permitted for this Im sexual impurity, Paul adds to that now that this new situation has developed, namely uh, Gentiles, when they become believers, have spouses who abandon them because they don't share that faith. And so Paul says that divorce would be permissible here. So you see that there is a certain adjustment that takes place given these kinds of contexts. Now we come to some of the sticky points, if that wasn't sticky enough, uh, talking about Canaanite wars and uh, servitude in the Old Testament. Now, we're going to spill over a little bit. We got started a little bit later, so we're going to uh, spill over into the, uh, the break time. As uh, Craig said, we've got a little bit of a buffer here. But Israel's uh, Canaanite wars, we need to remember, are not acts of genocide. We need to understand what is actually going on here. It's more along the lines of a corporate capital punishment that is going on. But the, there's even nuance here when we look at that. So let's take a look at the moral and theological significance of the command for the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. <clears throat> for one thing, the warfare against the Canaanites was unique and non-universalizable. In other words, this is something that is commanded for a particular period of time and not for something that is, you know, for all, uh, it's not something, a command for all the people of God forever and ever, amen. You know, when, when some people will ask this question, I don't know if you've heard this sort of a thing before, how would you like it if another nation attacked yours? And they act as though God isn't in the picture. They act as though the Israelites are not uniquely set apart for God's saving purposes. And they just act as though, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, it's just like Israel is like any other nation. And of course, that becomes a huge problem. 
uh, once you get rid of that significant feature, well then, yes, you don't have any sort of justification for the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. But we have to also keep this in mind. Does the command, if a person says, how would you like it if you know, somebody said, you know, God told me to do this, to, to kill this people, to drive out this people or whatever. Well, does this command, alleged command, have the backing of all kinds of public signs and wonders, like the ten plagues? In Egypt, the Red Sea crossing, uh, manna uh, on, the, on the ground every morning, uh, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night over the camp uh, like it was over the Israelites. Uh, also, is the nation under consideration characterized by criminal acts such as incest, ritual prostitution, infant sacrifice, bestiality? I mean, this, this, it's not as though the Israelites are driving out the Canaanites because, boy, they wear tattoos and we don't, <laughs> or they eat shrimp and we don't. No, this is something much more significant. This is, uh, you know, again, things that would be considered criminal acts in any civilized society. And again, if you get rid of this idea that God is somehow not in the picture, that Israel is not, doesn't have any sort of unique standing in light of God's calling them and seeking to bring, use them to bring blessing to the nations, it's sort of like removing Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. You don't have much of a story. It doesn't really hang together all that well. And so if you get rid of God and Israel's unique status, then you don't really have a story. <laughs> it doesn't really cohere or make sense. Furthermore, we can say this, that if there is this good God who is all wise, who knows his, these purposes that are going to bring about the salvation of the, the, uh, to the ends of the earth, then he would have morally justifiable reasons for issuing this command against the Canaanites. So let me just you know, go on from here, and again, we'll just kind of fly through a few of these points. Remember that God is also waiting half a millennium, including 400, 430 years of slavery in Egypt. God said He would wait until the sin of the Amorites, a Canaanite peoples, was filled up when He told this to, to Abraham in Genesis 15. Also, the Israelites cannot enter the land until this time is right, when, the, when judgment the time for judgment is ripe upon the people of Canaan. God says that they, they cannot go in to inherit the land that He has promised them until that timing is just right. And God said He would vomit out the Israelites if they undertook those same acts that the Canaanites practiced. Indeed, that does happen. Uh, also, as we've seen before, God does not prefer judgment but urges repentance, and we do see people actually turning to, uh, you know, to the one true God. We think of Rahab, we think of the Shechemites at the end of Joshua chapter 8, these strangers who are actually part of this covenant renewal ceremony while Joshua is reading the law. Those are people who are Canaanites, who are aligning themselves with the people of God. Let me just move here now to a few distinctions that we want to talk about. Of course, we, you know, we, we need to remember this too, that if God is commanding something, He is not going to command something that is intrinsically evil. That is a morally, metaphysically impossible scenario for God to command something that is intrinsically evil. God, for example, when He talks about the uh, infant sacrifice that takes place in the ancient Near East and even practiced in, amongst the, the Israelites themselves, God, God through Jeremiah says that this is a thing which I never commanded or spoke of, nor did it ever enter my mind. Not that God didn't know that they would practice these things, but it's so far removed from the character of God that He would never command something intrinsically evil. So God can command something that is difficult but not impossible. So here we want to distinguish between three categories of duties. A lot of times when we look at the Scriptures, we think, oh, they're all on the same level. Uh, no, uh, kosher laws are not on the same level as loving the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are some laws that are temporary, some laws that are permanent, some laws that are absolute and some that may require a little bit of finessing in light of certain circumstances that override general duties. So let's talk about that a bit. We've seen that there is this command that is absolute to worship God, to love God. There is no variation on that, to not to engage in idolatry. Again, absolute across the board. But there are some what we call general duties that may on occasion be overridden given certain 
overriding considerations. So we think of deception. Generally, you don't deceive. But think about this. When you, leave, when you go out at night, do, you, do any of you leave your lights on? Isn't that deception? You're, you're sending the signal that someone is home when actually no one is home at all. Why don't you just leave your lights off, huh? Well, you're, you're anticipating potential criminal activity. We see that same sort of thing going on in Scripture. We see in the Old Testament, the Hebrew midwives, we see Rahab uh, who are engaged in deception in order to save innocent human life. It's kind of that Nazi question, hiding Jews. Do you deceive the Nazis? Yes, you do. You want to protect innocent human life. In fact, God commands this. When Saul is about to, when he's very jealous, of course, and, if he, and Samuel, who's about to anoint a new king in 1 Samuel 16, says, you know, if Saul hears about my going to Bethlehem to anoint a new king, he's going to kill me. So what does God tell him? He says, if anyone asks you why you're going to Bethlehem, say, you're going to offer a sacrifice there. Very convenient. Again, criminal activity, innocent life being threatened. This is justification for engaging in deception. Rather than saying, oh, you want to know where my friend, you know, who's running, you know, you, you know Emmanuel Kant used this example, the philosopher, you know, and if an axe murderer is running after your friend, Emmanuel Kant said you should actually tell if this axe murderer is running after your friend and you know where he's gone, you have an obligation to tell that axe murderer uh, would-be axe murderer, where he went, because it's, after all, you, you have an obligation to tell the truth to everyone, straightforward, uh, no deception at all, and it's on the axe murderer, it's not on you if you tell him where, he, where, the, where your friend went. Uh, no, it's a little bit different in Scripture. There is some shading here, and I think that that's where Kant gets a few things wrong. But anyway, I think we could say the same thing when it comes to taking innocent human life. Generally, it is morally wrong to do so. But there may be certain instances where taking innocent human life would be morally justifiable, even if tragic. So an ectopic pregnancy, when a woman is expecting, and the, the, the fertilized egg is trapped in the fallopian tube of the woman rather than implanting in the uterus, it would be morally justifiable, again though tragic, to take the life of this unborn one in order to save at least one life rather than losing two. Or if there is a terrorist uh, organization that hijacks a plane and the president or the prime minister says, shoot the plane out of the sky, even though it would mean killing innocent men, women, and children on board, we would say it would be morally justifiable. I mean, I, th I think a good, very good case could be made for that. Even though tragic, could it not be that when God is commanding the Israelites to drive the Canaanites out, if there is innocent life lost, that God would have morally justifiable reasons for issuing this kind of a command. Well, I'd say God is best positioned to say, to have moral justification for this kind of a command. So rather than treating all these commands as utterly absolute in every regard, we need to offer some sort of, I think, differentiation here, a kind of hierarchy uh, that is involved, a hierarchy of duties. Also keep this in mind, we're going to move on from here, uh, that the Canaanites themselves were warned. They had ample warning that this God had done signs and wonders in Egypt. They saw this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. They could have fled rather than having resisted God. Another key point here is this, that the Old Testament's warfare texts aren't always as straightforward as they seem along with other ancient Near Eastern war texts, that we frequently see this language of exaggeration or hyperbole, uh, leave alive nothing that breathes, utterly destroy. You see, when we see utter destruction, we, it's often accompanied by plenty of survivors in Scripture. Some people say, you're not taking the Bible literally if you allow for hyperbole or exaggeration. Actually, the Bible en engages in a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration, a lot of metaphorical language. The goal is not to take the Bible literally in every reading, but where the Bible calls for reading it figuratively, we read it figuratively. Uh, we, we, read, we don't read figuratively the resurrection of Jesus. We read that in a straightforward way, uh, this historical narrative. Uh, all the Gospels are saying the same thing, etc. But when we read in Isaiah about the trees of the field clapping their hands, we don't say, oh, I'm taking that literally as though I'm being more faithful to Scripture. No, that's, that we take 
the genres or the types of literature on their own, and we treat them in accordance with the way that the author wanted them to be understood. Uh, that the beasts, for example, in the book of Daniel are nations. They are not literal beasts. Uh, you know, the, the same thing with the book of Revelation. A uh, high degree of symbolism there. Don't say, I take the Bible literally. Maybe say, I take the Bible literarily, treating it according to each of its literary forms. And one of these is, one of those forms is the ancient Near Eastern war text, where we have a high degree of uh, exaggeration or hyperbole. Sort of like when we talk about this in our own sports, you know, we have kind of the sports genre. Oh, we totally slaughtered our opponents. Somebody get the police on this. <laughs> no, we, we understand that. And the same thing goes in the ancient Near East. We also have in these, uh, you know, this, this, uh, lang again, this language of utter destruction. As we read the, the texts, a lot of times people will say, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at how clear God is. It says they were utterly destroyed. There are no survivors and so forth. Well, you may take that literally, but why is it that you don't take the texts alongside them, very near them often, that, all, that go on to say that there were ample survivors? Why don't you take that literally? Why is it that you're only taking literally one side of the ledger but ignoring the other? So let's unpack this a little bit. Let's take a look at the ancient Near East briefly. Uh, King Tutmosis III, uh, he states that the numerous army of uh, Mitanni uh, was overthrown within an hour, annihilated totally and so forth, and is non-existent. Well, the historical fact was that forces, the forces of Mitanni uh, lived to fight beyond this into the 15th and 14th centuries, uh, you know, well beyond what Tutmosis III had claimed. Here's another example, the Bulletin of Ramses II uh, on Egypt's considerably less than decisive victory at Kadesh in Syria. Uh, in 1274, 1273. Look at the language here. Sound familiar? Millions of foreigners uh, that uh, he took no note of, that he regarded them as chaff. He slew the entire force, as well as all the chiefs of all the countries that had come with him, uh, that his majesty slaughtered and slew them in their places, and his majesty was alone, none other with him. So, no, he was the only one standing. Everyone else phew, wiped out. Well, remember, this was not a decisive victory. This was something that was quite, uh, you know, almost a, like a stalemate. But yet here he's using this kind of sweeping language. King uh, Misha of Moab said, Israel has utterly perished for always, but the historical fact was this is uh, premature by a hundred years when Assyria would actually destroy Israel and that that would actually, you know, a lot of Israel's, Israelites would survive, would become a mixed uh, group. Uh, well, so we need to keep this in mind that the primary command is to drive out the Canaanites, to dispossess them, which presupposes survivors. And this would work in two phases, drive them out and then kill those who are foolish enough to remain behind, who remain entrenched. Indeed, this is the sort of thing that we see in the, uh, in the biblical account, that the Israelites are going into these Canaanite cities, engaging in what are called disabling raids, according to Kenneth Kitchen, an, uh, an Egyptologist that they're going to these cities and then going back to their base camp at Gilgal. It's not as though they're just occupying these places. Only three places are destroyed by fire, Jericho and Ai and Hazor, but the rest are, you know, basically just disabled. You've got your, primarily your military people in these fortresses or citadels, and so there's this engagement of, dis, of, of uh, you know, of army to army, but then they go, once they've done their damage, then they go back to their base camp. And again, keep this in mind too, that the driving out of the Canaanites was not like some military blitzkrieg. It was, it was gradual. It was something that happened a little bit at a time. And we're told even though Joshua obeyed all that Moses commanded, like utterly destroy them, leave alive nothing that breathes, we're told that many nations still remain among the Israelites at the end of the book of Joshua. We read about how the Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So this is something that takes place over a long period of time, this gradual uh, sort of taking uh, over the land in which Yahweh becomes the dominant name. It takes a couple of hundred years before that actually takes place. Notice this even in Deuteronomy 7, when the Lord, notice these three stages, when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are uh, entering to possess it, clears away the many nations before you, uh, you shall defeat them, and then get this, number two, you shall utterly destroy them, but I thought you've already defeated them. Then it says, utterly destroy them. Then number three, it goes on to say, you shall make no covenant with them, but I thought you've already destroyed them. I thought you've already defeated them. What, what's going on here? 
it presupposes that there are going to be people around. Again, there's that language of, uh, you know, that language of utter destruction. We have to be careful about how we, how we understand that. Um, Ian Proven of Regent College says that this whole idea of, you know, seeing that there are these survivors that are hanging around leads us to wonder, what does that term utterly destroy, karem, uh, haram, actually mean? So we actually see that, uh, you know, that these, in these three stages, that it seems to be, if you read it in a literal way, it's just hard to make sense of. There is a, a little bit more of a, a, you know, there's a bit more shading here that, that needs to be understood. We're even told in, in Jeremiah 25 that God is going to utterly destroy Judah through the Babylonians and leave their cities in everlasting desolation. Well, you get to the end of the book and, well, no, there are plenty of Judahites still around. Uh, there, you know, the liberal, the, the, the urban elite go to uh, Babylon. Uh, a lot of people remain behind to tend the to tend to land and so forth. And we see that there is not that sweeping, utter destruction, but there is certainly economic, military, political, religious disabling, if you will. There, these, 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 these structures have been incapacitated. Well, that's all I'm going to say about warfare. Let me quickly move on to talking about um, uh, the uh, slavery or servitude issue. And I'll just try to wrap this up in the next uh, seven minutes or so. This uh, Sam Harris, one of the uh, new atheists, talks about how uh, slaves were treated as farm equipment in the Old Testament. And a lot of times when people see slavery or, or, or slave in the Old Testament, they think, oh, Antebellum slavery. They, they think about the civil, the, the antebellum South. Uh, they think about colonialism, the Civil War, Jim Crow laws, and so forth. And this is much different than what we are talking about in the Old Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's kind of interesting. The King James Version use, only uses "slave" once, and that is actually not even in the uh, in the Hebrew text. It's actually inserted by the translator. But in, you know, but in 19, you know, so in 1984, we have the term slave and the terms you know, used, uh, you know, that is 104 times and slavery 17 times. It's kind of strange that given all of this history of colonialism, etc., that you would now have this very loaded emotional term that is used, slave, slavery. People don't think of this as indentured servitude. They think immediately of the antebellum South. And I think that it calls for a bit more of a nuance in translation here. But what we can say about the term eved is that it should be translated more like servant or worker. It's related to the verb avad, to work or to serve. And uh, it reflects a dependency relationship, someone who is working for someone else. And it's not an intrinsically negative term. So when the term servant is used in some places, it's actually an honorific title that, uh, that um, Moses and Joshua are called Eved Adonai, the servant of the Lord. And, uh, and, and this is a, a, a very appropriate title of honor. Uh, in the Exodus even, the Israelites, not to mention the, the Egyptians, they are called the servants, slaves of Pharaoh. But when God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. They're moving from one servitude to another. It's not as though there is an inherently negative association with that term, but rather it is, depends upon the context. Yes, it was more like slavery in Egypt, but uh, under God, this was, we can call this servitude, if you will. The Israelites, uh, in impoverished conditions... Would, could become voluntarily indentured servitude. You, you sold yourself, if you will. Uh, for a, you contracted yourself out so that you could live under someone's roof, get clothing, food, and so forth for a certain period of time. And if you wanted to, it wasn't necessarily a bad deal to have someone else taking care of all of your practical needs that you would say, I love my master, I love my employer, I'm going to live under his roof. Uh, and, and so that is what uh, you know, Exodus allows for. Gentiles, keep this in mind, Gentiles could not own land in Israel and would naturally and typically attach themselves to Israelite households. So you have another scenario here when it comes to the Gentiles. There are provisions that are made for servants in Israel. They're, they could be freed through injury, uh, that if you knocked out your, uh, if you gouged out your servant's eye or you knocked out his tooth, then he could go free. And that's where we get the term indentured. Uh, you know, if you knock out his tooth. Uh, <clears throat> Indeed, a master could be executed if he struck his servant and killed him. 
Furthermore, there's no right of return that runaway slaves who came from other lands were to find harbor, refuge in any of, Israelites, in any of Israel's cities rather than being sent back to a harsh master. There's to be compassion for those who are being oppressed. Also, there are, there are controls to prevent poverty uh, through, you know, through gleaning laws, six-year service limits, the year of Jubilee where the land would revert back to its, its owner. Uh, they wouldn't have, to, wouldn't have to lease out that land any longer. Uh, the care for the stranger, the orphan, and the widow uh, who are in your midst. There was a concern about those who are the most vulnerable in society. We're told in Leviticus 19, the stranger, Ger, who resides with you shall be as, with, as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are aliens, Gerim, in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Well, then there's this passage in Leviticus 25. We're told that aliens and sojourners can be acquired and can work for the Israelites permanently. Now, here in the same book, we're told to love the alien, love the alien but then we're told that you can acquire the alien. Uh, is this a sudden shift to justify mistreatment of aliens? No, of course not. Aliens, of course, we said, would have had to attach themselves to houses, households since aliens couldn't own land themselves. In fact, the tendency would be then to keep on lingering in these, uh, in these households because you could not acquire land, uh, you know, even though you're a foreigner. But Leviticus 25, 47, it goes on to say this, that an alien or sojourner, the same word, if he becomes a person of sufficient means, can acquire an Israelite as a servant. So just as the Israelites could acquire servants from among the Gentiles, so the Gentiles who become sufficiently uh, you know, endowed, they've worked their way up, so to speak, they could acquire an Israelite. Even though that wasn't, uh, wasn't optimal, there was still that possibility. So it's important to see these things in their broader context. Uh, the Old Testament scholar Christopher Wright says, the slave in the Old Testament was given human and legal rights unheard of in contemporary societies. We certainly see that. Let me just make a few concluding remarks here and then we'll wrap up. God is not opposed to our asking hard, honest questions. Also in the Old Testament, God speaks into an ancient Near Eastern setting that's far removed from our own, less than ideal circumstances, so God, uh, circumstances, so God accommodates Himself to work within those fallen structures and to move, rem, to move them in a redemptive direction. Also the, Mos the law of Moses is not ideal. In, in every facet, that there are commands given because of the hardness of human hearts and that there's also a certain dynamism to it, that there are certain things that are in flux a bit given the various uh, situations in which the Israelites find themselves. The New Testament authorities align themselves with the God of the Old Testament without apology. And in both the Old and New Testaments, we see the kindness and severity of God, Romans eleven twenty two. Let me just say something about God's love and wrath. And I like this quotation from Miroslav Volf, who says this about his own experience. He says, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination, and I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I'd have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. Thanks for listening, and we're out of time, but feel free to come up for any questions. Thank you.